In this video, we're gonna look at a bunch of basic exercises involving rings. So let's hop right into it. So the first one we want to show is that if u is a unit in a ring, then so is minus u. And we'll notice that uh, implicitly this is implying that this is a ring with one, because otherwise the notion of a unit doesn't really make sense. Okay, great. So in order to do this very properly, we actually need a few lemmas. And the first lemma that we're going to need is that if you take uh, negative 1 squared, you should get 1. In other words, if you take negative, in other words, if you take the additive inverse of the identity element and you square it, you get 1. And so uh, notice that we can prove this in a pretty simple way. So this is equivalent to the following. This is equivalent to uh, looking at negative 1 squared plus negative 1 and getting 0. Okay, so if we get this equation is equal to 0, that means negative 1 squared and negative 1 are additive inverses. But we already know that um, negative 1 and 1 are additive inverses. But then by the uniqueness of additive inverses, which is true because under addition we have an abelian group, um, we know that these two guys are the same. Okay, so now we can use the fact that this is a ring to factor some stuff out. But maybe before I do this, I'm going to write this as negative one square negative one times negative one plus negative one uh, times one okay now I'm gonna factor a minus one out of the left of this and that's gonna leave me with negative one plus one but notice that's gonna be negative one uh, times zero which is equal to zero so again, what that tells me is that negative 1 squared and negative 1 are additive inverses, but negative 1 and 1 are already additive inverses, and then by the uniqueness we have this lemma satisfied. Okay, now uh, the next thing that I want to prove is this following little lemma, which uh, says that uh, negative a is the same thing as negative 1 times a, which is the same thing as a times negative 1. Okay, so now let's go ahead and read into this very carefully. By negative a, I mean the additive inverse of a. By negative 1 times a, I mean negative 1 times a, obviously, where negative 1 is the additive inverse of the multiplicative identity, and then this is just that multiplication in the other order. So uh, let's go ahead and see if we can do this proof. So we're going to start with um, a uh, plus negative 1 times a. But then notice that we can write this as 1 times a uh, plus negative 1 times a. But then factoring out of the right, we get 1 plus negative 1 times a, but that's equal to 0. So again, what that tells us is that negative 1 times a and a are additive inverses, but the additive inverse of a is negative a, so that gives just this first equality. Now the second equality is going to be pretty much the same thing, so we're going to do a uh, plus a times negative 1, but we can rewrite that as a times 1 plus a times negative 1, and then distributing out of the other side, we get a times the quantity 1 plus negative 1, but that's going to be 0. But now what that tells us is that a times negative 1 and a are additive inverses of each other, but then the additive inverse of a is negative a, and then by uniqueness that makes um, these three things the same. Okay, so now that we've got these lemmas, uh, we're ready to prove this result. So I'll clean up the board and then we'll do that. So now let's go ahead and prove this result. So uh, let's take u inverse in R such that uh, u times u inverse equals 1. And we know such um, a u inverse exists because we're assuming that u is a unit. Now uh, from here we want to look at the following equation. So let's look at negative u times negative u inverse. 
So that's kind of the obvious place to look uh, for an inverse of negative u. Just think about like the inverse of negative two inside of the rational numbers, that's gonna be negative one half, which is obviously the inverse of, uh, sorry, negative the inverse of two. But now what we can do is use the associativity of multiplication along with all of our other um, preparatory results to get the following. So this is gonna be u times negative one times negative one times u inverse, but that gives us negative one squared in the middle, which is gonna be one. So this is gonna be u times u inverse, which equals one. Which tells us uh, that we have negative u quantity inverse is really equal to uh, negative u inverse. Okay, great. So um, the next couple examples I wanna look at all have to do with nilpotent elements. So we say that x in a ring R is nilpotent if x to the m equals zero for some natural number m. So let's see, for example, in Z4, so in the ring Z4, if we take two and we square it, we get four, which is equal to zero, which means two is a nilpotent element in Z4. Okay, so now uh, let's assume that x is a nilpotent element. Then the first thing that we want to prove is that x is e either equal to zero or a zero divisor. So uh, let's go ahead and first suppose that x is not equal to zero, which means we want to show that it's a zero divisor. And so then let's go ahead and let the m be the natural number such that x to the m equals zero and m is the smallest such natural number. So any natural number smaller than m does not take you to zero. But now notice we can factor this guy right here as x to the m minus one times x, which equals zero. And we know that um, x is not equal to zero and x to the m minus one is also not equal to zero because that would uh, contradict the smallness of m which tells us that they are both um, zero divisors. So in other words, if you have a nilpotent element, then it has to be a zero divisor. Okay, good. I'm gonna clean up this portion of the board, then we're gonna do a couple more examples involving zero divisors. Next thing that we wanna prove about nilpotent elements is that if you've got a nilpotent element in a ring with one, and so now I'm including the fact that um, R is going to be a ring with one, then if you take uh, that identity element one and you add it to X, that's going to give you a unit. And so um, this is actually pretty easy if you know the trick. It's kind of hard to motivate the trick unless you know it or you have like on the tip of your tongue um, some knowledge about uh, factorization of polynomials. But here's what we're gonna do. So let's go ahead and let m be that natural number such that um, x to the m equals zero and m is uh, minimum. So it's the minimum such natural number that takes x to zero. And now notice that that means the identity is the same thing as the identity plus x to the m because that's obviously just the identity plus zero. But now we can factor this right hand side. So this uh, right hand side factors like one plus x times uh, one minus x plus x squared minus x cubed, um, dot, 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 and then it's gonna be minus one to the m minus one times x to the m minus one. Okay, great. But what that tells us is that um, one plus x is a unit because we found an element that when we multiply them together, we get back to the identity. In other words, we can say one plus x inverse is equal to one minus x plus x squared minus x cubed all the way up to minus one to the m minus one, x to the m minus one. Great. So we've got a unit there. All right, I'm gonna clean up the board and then we're gonna keep going with these examples. Our next couple examples are gonna to have to do with things called Boolean rings. 
So we say that R is a Boolean ring if A squared equals A for all A in R. And so the first result will be that all Boolean rings are commutative. In other words, we have AB equals BA for all A and B and R. And I'm going to go ahead and change this to X and Y. I mean, obviously that's kind of the same thing because these are just dummy variables. But I want to use uh, X and Y because I've used A up there for my condition. So A squared equals A. So now <clears throat> the trick is we want to combine X and Y together in a way and then square it uh, and use this condition in order to root out the fact that x times y equals y times x. So there's probably a bunch of ways to do this and you can fiddle around with it, but I think the cleanest way is to look at this. So let's look at x plus y squared. And then on the one hand, that's going to be equal to x plus y because we're inside a Boolean ring and every element in a Boolean ring squares to itself. Then the on the other hand, this is going to be equal to x plus y times x plus y, which we can FOIL out, keeping in mind that we know that um, this is not necessarily commutative at the moment, so that's going to give us x squared plus xy plus yx plus y squared. Great. So we've got something like that going on. Now, uh, the next thing to notice is that um, we have x squared and y squared on this side of the equation, and we have xy on this side of the equation, but because we're in a Boolean ring, those things are the same. So uh, that means we can cancel out this from both sides of the equation, but that is going to give us xy plus uh, yx equals zero. Okay, but now that's going to give us xy equals negative yx. But now we can square both sides of this equation. That'll give us xy squared equals um, negative yx squared. But we know xy squared is just going to be x times y because we're inside a Boolean ring. And then we know uh, negative yx squared. Well, I'll leave it to you guys to prove that um, negative a value squared in a ring is the same thing as positive that value squared in a ring. Um, so that's very, very similar to this very first example that we did. So that's going to be the same thing as yx squared. But because we're in a Boolean ring, that's the same thing as yx. And so we have this commutativity condition. So notice we have uh, phi of zero is the same thing as phi of zero plus zero, which is the same thing as phi of uh, zero plus phi of zero. Now the next thing we can do is subtract phi of zero from both sides, and that's going to cancel everything out on the left-hand side, so we'll get zero equals phi of zero. That's all there is to this. So now the next thing that we want to show is that if you have identities in R and S, and phi is on to, then the identity in R has to be mapped to the identity in S. Um, okay, good. So let's see how this will go. So now since phi is on to, then that means there is an element from R that gets mapped to 1S. We don't know that element is 1R yet. So um, let's go ahead and take our element A in R such that phi of A equals 1S. And now notice that uh, this A does not have to be equal to 1R because nothing here says that this thing is injective. What we want to show that phi of 1R is also 1S. Okay, and we can do that in the following way. So notice that we can take phi of 1R. So notice that's happening over there in S. But that's going to be the same thing as phi of 1R times uh, 1S. Just multiply by the identity. But now we know that phi of 1S is equal to phi... Uh, sorry, 1s is equal to phi of a, so we can take this and write it as phi of 1r times phi of a. But now using the fact that this is a ring homomorphism, we can smush these together. We get 1r times a, 
And then uh, we know that 1r times a is just phi of a, uh, is just a, so we have phi of a there, but then we know phi of a is equal to uh, 1s. Okay, so now let's look at the extreme left and right hand side of this and we see that 1r gets mapped to 1s. Okay, so for our last example, we want to show that z adjoin i is an integral domain. So these are the Gaussian integers. In other words, um, elements of the form a plus bi, where a and b are in z. So uh, let's go ahead and take um, z, which is equal to a plus bi, and w, which is equal to c plus di in z adjoined i. And uh, let's suppose that z times w equals zero. So we're working towards showing that either z is zero or w is zero by looking at what it would take to have a zero divisor. But that's the same thing as a plus bi times c plus di equals zero. And now from here we want to use a trick. So we want to transport this over just into the integers. And we can do that by multiplying by the complex conjugate of these two guys. So notice if we multiply by a minus bi times c minus di, well, that's still going to be equal to zero because we multiply both sides of this by zero. Um, so that's going to give us, uh, after multiplying these two, we will have a squared plus b squared equals zero, sorry, times, and then multiplying these bottom two, times c squared plus d squared equals zero. But now using the fact that um, z is an integral domain, we have that a squared plus b squared equals zero, or c squared plus d squared equals zero. But notice that a squared plus, plus b squared is always bigger than or equal to zero. The only way to make it equal to zero is if a and b are both zero. And that is clear because a and b are both non-negative numbers. So uh, this tells us that a equals zero and b equals zero, or c equals zero and d equals zero for the same reason. But if a and b are both zero, that tells us that z is equal to zero, or if c and d are both zero, that tells you that w is equal to zero. But that's the exact condition that we need for this to be an integral domain. All right, this is a good place to stop.